Hello and welcome to Rugby and District Astronomical Society's Sky Notes for the period from the 21st of June to the 18th of August 2013. As usual we'll start off with the view of the night sky directly overhead which will be at around about 0100 on the 1st of August, midnight on the 15th of August and 2300 hours on the 31st of August. Almost directly overhead, but skewed slightly towards the south, you'll find the Summer Triangle made up of the stars Vega, Deneb and Altair. Also clearly visible are the constellations of Cassiopeia and Ursa Major with the asterism of the pl Before sunrise on the 3rd of August, about 0430 hours, there's a nice grouping of the Moon which will have a 12% crescent phase, Jupiter at a magnitude of about minus 0.7, Mars at 2.8 and Mercury at 2, but Mercury will only be 4 degrees above the horizon. Sunrise and sunset times for August. The days get shorter as we travel through the month and the Earth gets gradually closer to the Sun. So on the, fir so on the 1st of August the day length is nearly 15 hours 24 minutes long, but at the end of the month we're down to just over 13 and a half hours. The phases of the Moon for August, on the 6th we have a new Moon, on the 14th we have first quarter, the 21st is full Moon and the 28th we're in last quarter. On the evening of the 12th to the 13th of August we have the maximum of the Perseid meteor shower. This shower is associated with the comet Swift-Tuttle and the meteors we see are particles ejected by the comet as it travels on, on its 130 year orbit. Most of the dust today and the meteors that we see are over a thousand years old. However there's a relatively young filament of dust in the stream that was pulled off the comet in 1865 and the rate of meteors originating from this filament is much higher than from the older part of the stream. We'll move on now to our constellation of the month and for August it's going to be Volpecula which will be very high overhead um, near Cygnus and uh, the Summer Triangle so it should be fairly easy to find although the constellation itself doesn't feature any stars greater than magnitude 4.4. Volpecula was first introduced to the uh, atlases by the Polish astronomer Johannes Hevelius in the late 17th century. Unusually for a northern co uh, hemisphere constellation it's not associated with any figure in mythology unlike many constellations in this part of the sky such as Pegasus which you can see bordering Volpecula to the left hand side. The constellation was originally named Volpecula cum Ansere or Volpecula et Ansa which means the little fox with the goose. The constellation was originally depicted as a fox holding a goose in its jaws. The stars were later separated to form two constellations, Ansa and Volpecula, then merged again to the present day Volpecula constellation. The goose was left out of the constellation's name, but instead the brightest star Alpha carries the name Ansa. Volpecula is quite easy to find if you look at the summer triangle of Vega Deneb and Altair and then go down about halfway between Vega and Altair and you'll see that the constellation takes up an area straddling the main part of the Milky Way. Looking at the stars in the constellation we'll start off with Ansa or Alpha. It's a red giant star, has an apparent visual magnitude of 4.44 and lies approximately 297 light years from the Sun. ANSA forms a wide optical binary with the star 8 Volpecula, which is an orange giant about 484 light years from the Earth. 8 Vol has an apparent magnitude of 5.81. 23 Vol is the second brightest star in the constellation. Again, it's an orange giant and has an apparent visual magnitude of 4.52 and lies approximately 328 light years distance. And it's actually a binary star. The third brightest star in the constellation is 31, has a visual magnitude of 4.59 and 
and he's 216 light years distant. It's also a variable star. Slightly to the east of Messier object number 27, which is the Dumbbell Nebula, and we'll be coming on to that in a moment, is the star HD 189733, or V452 Vol. The primary components believed to be an orange dwarf, and the other stars a red dwarf. The stars have an apparent magnitude of 6.07 and 10.116, and have an orbital period of around about 3,200 years, and this system can easily be found in binoculars. The primary star is smaller and a lot less luminous than the Sun, but in October 2005 an extrasolar planet HD 189733b was confirmed to be orbiting the primary star. It's known as a hot Jupiter planet, which is a large gas giant with a close orbit to the star. It's the first extrasolar planet discovered to have carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. Also lying in a constellation are a couple of pulsars, both of which were firsts. The first first was the first one to be discovered. Astrophysicist Jocelyn Bell Burnell and her supervisor Anthony Hewish discovered the pulsar in 1967. And the, because the signal was so regular and appeared to be artificial, it was originally known by the designation LGM1, which stands for Little Green Men 1. It's now known as a PSR b 1919 plus 21. It lies 2,283 light years away and has a period of just over 1.33 seconds. The second one is PSR B1937 plus 21. It's the first millisecond pulsar ever discovered and is only a few degrees away from PSR B1919 plus 21. It was discovered in 1982, the second it completes over 640 revolutions. Going into some non-stellar objects, the most famous one is Messier 27, or NGC 6853, the Dumbbell Nebula. It's one of the best known and largest planetary nebulae in the sky, and it was formed when a dying star threw off its outer layers of gas. It's known as the Dumbbell Nebula because its double lobe structure resembles a barbell. It's also the first planetary nebula ever discovered and Charles Messier first observed it in 1764. The nebula has an apparent magnitude of 7.5 and is around 1360 light years away from the solar system. It's about 8 arc minutes in diameter and can easily be observed in binoculars and small telescopes. And the central star, a white dwarf, is larger than any other known white dwarf. Here we have a couple of images. The first one was taken a single DSLR image through a 4 inch telescope and you can clearly see the colour and shape of the dumbbell. Visually you'd just be able to see a, a grey shape which would share this shape but you wouldn't pick up the blue in it. Through a slightly larger 6 inch telescope and a composite of 20 individual images a bit more of the structure becomes visible including the lobing, the fringing and the, the two lobes that are less visible at 90 degrees to the lobes that are more easily seen. Moving on to Broch's cluster, which is also known as Al Sufi's cluster, or Colinda 399, it's a group of stars located near the border of Sagitta. The brighter stars form the asterism known as the coat hanger, which is a very well known and easy to locate asterism and looks very nice in a pair of binoculars. Objects NGC 6823 and NGC 6820 are actually superimposed on one another and both located near Messier 27. 6823 is an open cluster. It's about 50 light years across and lies 6,000 light years from the Earth. The centre of the cluster is believed to be about 2 million years old and contains many young blue stars. NGC 6820 is the surrounding emission nebula that surrounds these new stars and the outer parts of the cluster that appear to be next to the pillars of nebula are home to even younger stars. Continuing our series on the orbits of the planets, we're going to have a look now at how orbits are determined. If you wish to find out where and how fast an object is moving, you need to know seven things. You need to know the x, y and z coordinates of the object and also the relative motion that it has in relation to yourself. 
If you imagine sitting still watching somebody walk up a steep hillside, the X and Y coordinates would be their latitude and longitude, and the Z coordinates would be their altitude above sea level. This would give you their position relative to yourself. If you could also measure their speed, travelling north and south relative to you, east and west relative to you, and any changes in altitude, you would then be able to determine the three changes in speed, which are the change in the east-west, north-south and altitude, in relation to yourself. Finally, you need to know the time that you made these observations, and that will give you the seven factors that you need to determine the position, the speed and the time that you made the observations. When we go to look at a planetary orbit, these coordinates and velocities are described by what's known as the six orbital elements. The first two elements determine the size and shape of the ellipse or the orbit of the planet. The eccentricity, or lowercase e, is the shape of the ellipse describing how much it is elongated compared to a circle. And here we have a circle superimposed on the ellipse that we're looking at here. The semi-major axis is the sum of what's known as the periapsis and the apoapsis distances. These are the distances a and minus a from either f or minus f, which are the two foci of the ellipse. Adding these distances together and dividing gives us the average orbital distance of a planet or other body around a sun or in the case of a moon around the planet that, is, that it is orbiting. Moving away from the shape of the orbit and looking at its r position relative to what's known as a plane of reference. The plane of reference in the solar system is the ecliptic which is the imaginary plane between the centre of the earth and the centre of the sun. All the other planets have orbits that are slightly inclined to our own ecliptic which is why we have to wait 105 years for the next transit of Venus. There are two elements which define the orientation of the orbital plane in which the ellipse is embedded. The first of which is the inclination. This is the vertical tilt of the ellipse with respect to the reference plane as mentioned before the ecliptic measuring the ascending node where the body passes upwards from below the orbit of the Earth to above the orbit of the Earth. The second element is the longitude of the ascending node. This can be thought of as a bearing. Much as we take a bearing from north using a compass, we take it from our reference direction to the point of the ascending node for the celestial body we're looking at in relation to ourselves here on Earth. The reference direction of course is the first point of Aries, which is a sort of Greenwich meridian of the heavens. The final two elements are the argument of the periapsis, which is the point where the celestial body reaches its closest to the reference body. In this case the Earth, we'd be looking at something like Mars reaching its closest point to us. And we have the angle of the lowercase omega as shown here. Then finally we have the true anomaly. This is effectively the time that we've taken the measurements and it's with respect to an epoch. If you have any star atlases handy, you'll be able to see that these have various epochs marked on them, from one of the early Norton star atlases, which is an epoch of 1920, to one of the Cambridge star atlases, which is an epoch of 2000.0. And finally, we have our roundup of our members images for the month. We'll start off in Earth orbit. Here we have an iridium flare taken on the 21st of June as it passed by Arcturus. Simply taken with a tripod mounted camera and the details all on the photo. Then we have from the 13th of June a composite photo of the International Space Station and the automated transfer vehicle number 4, the Albert Einstein. It's now docked with the station but you can see the two trails here the ISS on the left and the ATV on the right a few minutes later. A little bit further out, Dave Green has taken this picture of the Moon on the 16th of June with his, Nick, uh, with his 4SE and his Nikon DSLR, it's a single frame image. I've been using the Club Astro Master 
just after checking it out optically take a few photos with a small compact digital camera this one's of the moon with a fine pick 650 and you can see the shape of the eyepiece in the image the black um, outer edge isn't actually part of anything I've done it's part of the original image zooming in using the camera zoom we have this image of the lunar south pole again taken with the Astro Master 114 and sinus iridium here we have a Birio taken with the 6 inch telescope and the same uh, fine pix 650 here we have the ring nebula the one the first image I've got using my uh, CCD system and finally we have M51 the Whirlpool Galaxy this is three 60 second exposures in each of the red, green and blue channels with final processing done in the free graphics manipulation program GIMP It's taken on the 7th of July so we'll leave it with this image until we see you again next month for another Sky Notes.